Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and to the uh, Lehrman Auditorium. Uh, if you can, just take one quick moment to make sure that your cell phone is silenced, um, that it won't be vibrating too loudly. Thank you. The American dream is dead. That's a quote from candidate Donald Trump. Uh, he famously announced this as he was on the campaign trail to the astonishment of many Beltway elites, uh, which is understandable given how thick their bubbles are. Uh, from their perspective, things were great. Uh, the Great Recession had ended, the economy was growing, unemployment was plummeting, the stock market was at all-time highs. How could anyone seriously claim that the American dream was dead? The elites don't just have thick bubbles, they also have thick communities. And inside the protective cocoon of community, the American dream is alive and well today. But for many Americans, Trump was the first politician to articulate their reality. And as Tim Carney points out in his new book, Alienated America, perfect, when one studies the electoral map, especially with the counties that went strongest for Trump during the primary elections, uh, what one finds is that it's the counties that lacked what the social scientists call social capital that went strongest for Trump. Uh, the counties where churches are shuttering, where marriage rates are declining, where single parenting and absentee dads are the norm, where suicides and opioid overdoses and deaths of despair are exploding. In short, there are certain geographical regions in the United States that simply lack actual community. And where community is lacking, so too is opportunity. Where opportunity is dead, so too is the American dream. And so the suffering of America's working class is real. Uh, immobility, inequality, a retreat from marriage, deaths of despair are all symptoms. Uh, the root cause, as Tim Carney argues, is the collapse of local community for the working class, the institutions of civil society that are still strong in some parts of America, specifically among the elites, are fading away for many Americans. Uh, that, in a nutshell, is one of the major theses of Tim Carney's new book. Uh, it's a wonderful blend of storytelling, of firsthand reporting, data analysis, and the synthesis of various academic uh, studies and theories all made accessible for ordinary readers with polished prose. Uh, I read the book several weekends ago. Uh, it's a page turner. I highly recommend it. And so today we're joined by the author. Uh, Tim is, a co is the commentary editor at the Washington Examiner. He's a visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. He's the author of two previous books. Uh, the first one titled The Big Ripoff, How Big Business and Big Government Steal Your Money. And the second one, Obamanomics, how Barack Obama is bankrupting you and enriching his Wall Street friends, corporate lobbyists, and union bosses. Today, Tim joins us to talk about his new book, Alienated America, about the American dream, and about what we all can do to rebuild community and opportunity for everyone. So please join me in welcoming Tim Carney. Thank you, Ryan. Thank everybody here for coming. Uh, yes, I'm a, a journalist as a full-time job, so my, my story here is a story about the American dream, but as a reporter, of course, as a political reporter, my story starts in Iowa, and as an Irish Catholic, my story starts in a bar. It, it was Joe's place in Iowa City uh, shortly before the caucuses, and I met a, a couple that she was a, she worked at the university there, and <clears throat> She was explaining to me that she grew up in Iowa, now lived in Iowa City, but I asked her where exactly she's from. I'd, I've been covering caucuses since I, my first trip there was 2002, covering Howard Dean. So I, I know a good bit of Iowa, but it's a big state. She said she was from Orange City. I said, well, what makes Orange City orange? Because as I said, I'm an Irish Catholic, and so I'm really into ethnicity, and the color orange can trigger me sometimes. I was wondering whether this was a bunch of Protestant Ulster men marching through the streets in Northwest Iowa. No, Orange City was orange because it was overwhelmingly Dutch. And again, I love ethnicity talk, so I said, how Dutch is it? And she said, let me put it this way. As a child, I would wear clogs, march down the street past Windmill Square, during the Tulip Festival. It was like, as she went on, it was like the Simpsons episode doing a send up of Dutch people in the Midwest. It was absurdly, it was absurdly Dutch. And so I, uh, <clears throat> I, I pressed her on this and I said, um, and, well, she, she went on to keep telling this story and it sure enough, I looked up the numbers and it's the Dutchess County in all of Iowa. 
So I went out to Sioux County. I went to Sioux Center to cover the caucuses. Jeb Bush was giving a talk at a Christian college called Dort College. And so here again, the Dutchness was overwhelming, right? I, the first couple I meet, the woman's name is Wilhelmina, which is the name of the Queen of the Netherlands through World War I and World War II. I think every woman above the age of 60 in that room was named Wilhelmina. The other thing besides the Dutchness that was overwhelming here was interesting, and again, this is before the first caucuses, so you've got 17 Republicans going out there. And in that very conservative town, in this conservative Christian college, what I found was a very strong antipathy to Donald Trump. Most of the people here were probably Rubio supporters, a lot of Jeb, a lot of Ted Cruz supporters. One person who was a Rubio supporter wouldn't even say Trump's name, would say one candidate with the initials DT and in asking the question. I talked to one pastor who said of his 900 congregants, he knew of only one who was backing Trump in those early caucuses. Now in the general election, uh, Sioux County would go overwhelmingly for Donald Trump as it tends to go overwhelmingly for Republican candidates. But early on, there was this strong antipathy. And sure enough, in the caucuses, Sioux County, the most conservative, most Christian county in all of Iowa, was Trump's weakest county. He got only 11%. His other two worst counties were other two heavily Dutch counties, Marion and Lyon County. Now, if you follow the caucuses and all the primaries, you know that Trump's strongest region was the South, which in a lot of ways is the most Christian conservative region in the country. So there was some distinction here where we political analysts would talk about the evangelical vote. There was something going on in a place like Orange County versus a place like a lot of the South. <clears throat> and we talk about the evangelical vote, the Hispanic vote, the soccer mom vote. We had never talked about the Dutch vote. So I was, what the heck is this Dutch vote? So I look at Western Michigan during the, those primaries. So that's where Holland, Michigan is. The DeVosses and Van Andels, all these Dutch names populate out there. And sure enough, while Trump carried almost every county in the state, he lost the handful over there in Western Michigan. His worst counties were the most Dutch counties. His worst precinct that I could find in the whole state was the most Dutch precinct in the whole state. So something was going on here. When I'd spoken to the people at Dort to figure out what made these Dutch people tick, one guy there who's not Dutch, he was the husband of a professor at the college. And he was a, a liberal guy from out of state. And he said, the thing about the people here is they vote right but live left. And this has startled me. What did he mean? Were these all a bunch of you know, like swingers, smoking pod, what, what, did, what did live left mean? Were they vegans? No, he, he explained, he said, that's just what you do. You care about your neighbors, you care about your environment, but you also take care of it yourself. I was really bugged by it. What, what do you mean live, how is that living left? But I set that aside. This, this liberal thinks living left means caring for your neighbors and that having a really strong community. So set aside any critique of this uh, guy and I started to see what he meant. The sense of community was incredibly strong. The sense of duties to one neighbor in these places was very high. And social trust, which isn't high everywhere in the United States, was very high. The New Yorker in 2017 ran a profile of Orange City, channeling the arguments that people there make to the kids who go off to college somewhere else to come back. Their argument amounts to, quote, there are plenty of jobs. It'll take you five minutes to drive to work. When you have children, we'll help you take care of them. People here share your values. It's a good Christian place, and they care about you. If anything happens, they'll have your back. So it was starting to become clear to me what was happening in these early primaries. The man who declared the American dream was dead was bombing in the places where the American dream was most alive. Again, this is not about the general election where the choices between Hillary and Donald Trump. It's not about the later primaries. It's not about his approval ratings later on. And so we're not, right now we're talking about the earliest voters who came out, who had never voted in a Republican primary, who had never showed up at a caucus before in their life for sure, who either were Democrats or were totally politically inactive for decades. What was causing them to come out of the woodwork and support this guy over the 16, 17 other guys on the stage? And my position is the belief that the American dream is dead. And that was a very local thing. The dream was alive where you are or is dead where you are. So trying to nail down this Dutch thing a little more leading up to the Wisconsin primary, I visited a small village called Oostburg. 
Usburg is about 50% Dutch, and I got there on a Sunday morning, planted myself at the counter at Judy's place, the diner, and saw what should have been totally obvious to me about what made the Dutch people behave the way they were behaving. It was the people pouring in from the 9 a.m. services at the Reformed, uh, the First Reformed Church, or Bethel Orthodox Presbyterian. The families coming in from the 915 at First Presbyterian, not to be confused with those other two, or the 930 at First Christian Reformed Church, all in this village of 2000. Throughout the day, I learned many of them would go back that night at 6 p.m. for the second Sunday service or Bible study. The thing that made these Dutch communities so strong were the churches and the institutions that spin out of the churches. That was what tied people together, providing them with a sense of meaning, with a safety net, with a sense of purpose. These reformed churches had planted themselves in clusters all around the mid middle America, formed hardy, robust, tightly knit communities that avoided the afflictions that so much of rural America is experiencing. The inequality, the retreat from marriage, out of wedlock births, opioids, high school dropouts, deaths of despair. And it wasn't just the Dutch, of course. Trump's second worst state in the GOP primaries was Utah. His worst counties in the whole country were Mormon counties in Utah and Idaho. And I also saw it closer to home. While Trump carried most of my part of Montgomery County, Silver Spring, he lost badly in two precincts near my house. One is uh, the neighborhoods right around Arcola Avenue and Kemp Mill Road. Why? There's a modern Orthodox synagogue on Arcola Avenue and a modern Orthodox synagogue on Kemp Mill Road. Driving is forbidden on the Sabbath, and so you have very tightly knit uh, neighborhoods of people sharing a common faith, a common higher purpose, and raising their rather large families together. So with this shared purpose and a sense of belonging, this was the environment, whether it be in Oostburg, Salt Lake City, or Kent Mill Road, where the American dream seems alive. Now, a quick note about living right next to two Orthodox synagogues, especially when you have six children, is um, people often assume stuff about you that might not necessarily be true. So my, when my wife has been checking out buying beef at the grocery store, the cashiers have stopped her and said, excuse me, ma'am, looking at her six kids in tow and said, this beef is in kosher. And <clears throat> so it, it's nice to have people looking out for you like that. But that's uh, life in Silver Spring. So the same day crews carry the Orthodox precincts in, in Silver Spring, I went about 10 miles away uh, down the road to the village of Chevy Chase. I was covering Chevy Chase because, and I'm not talking about sort of lesser Chevy Chase where Brett Kavanaugh's from, the town of Chevy Chase or Chevy Chase, D.C. Those are sort of piker neighborhoods compared to the village. The village is the wealthiest municipality in the wealthiest region, in the wealthiest country in the history of the world. And like Oostburg, the population is 2,000. And while the average home in Oostburg is 150,000, the average home in Chevy Chase is one and a half million. The mean household income is 420,000. So Donald Trump, who got 54% statewide in my state of Maryland in the primaries there, got only 16% in Chevy Chase. The elites were rejecting Trump. In addition to losing Western Michigan, if we go back to Michigan, Trump lost Gross Point, Ann Arbor. Just as he didn't get 20% in Sioux and Marion County, the Dutch counties in Iowa, he also didn't get 20% in Johnson and Story County, Iowa, which are two of the most educated counties in all of America. South of Oostburg, Trump's worst counties in Wisconsin were the educated, suburban, wealthy counties of Waukesha, Ozaki, and Washington. So this points us, here I need to address something. We're, the places that Kasich won, the Chevy Chases, the Gross Points, these places that are now the same places that gave Democrats control, helped give Democrats control of the House, um, these are liberal elite communities largely. So here I need to address something I call the Lena Dunham fallacy. I wrote a piece in the, it's in the New York Times today about this belief. It's a false belief among many of my fellow conservatives that the liberal elites all graduate from Wesleyan, become swingers and decadent people who eschew marriage and hate children. Conservatives fall into this fallacy when we see that marriage rates are falling and, assume, and then we look at what's going on in Hollywood and uh, the way or in HBO series and assume that it's all a matter of these women's studies majors at Wesley and deciding a woman needs a man no more than a fish needs a bicycle. And so if there's, but the, that's not the way things are, are happening. If this liberal guy in Sioux County, Iowa could say that the uh, conservatives out there are voting right but living left, I'll say about Chevy Chase and Gross Point that they're voting left but living right. That is to say, 95% of Chevy Chase's families had two parents at home in 2015. 
In America today, that's amazing. 95% had two parents at home. The Village Hall hosts father-daughter dances with Scottish pipers. People, in short, in elite communities all over America, finish school, get married, have kids, stay married, get involved in their kids' lives, and then serve the community. The data on the elites nationwide tells the same story. 50% of babies born to working class women, women who haven't gone to college or haven't finished college, are born out of wedlock. It's only 10% born out of wedlock to college educated women. If you're a parent in the upper third of income, your children are half as likely to have an out of wedlock baby as if you're in the lower third. College educated men are much more likely to get married and half as likely to get divorced. As I would tell the conservatives who believe in the Lena Dunham fallacy, the liberal elites are practicing what we conservatives are preaching. So we see two different types of places that rejected Trump, right? Orange City, Holland, Salt Lake City, Kent Mill on one hand, Chevy Chase, Ann Arbor, Wauwatosa on the other. But in every place where Trump got below 20% in the country, basically fit into one of those two categories, elites, I mean strong religious or elites. But these aren't actually two different types of places. These are the same type of place. These places were the places where the American dream is alive because of many overlapping institutions of civil society. They are the places where communities are strong because they are planted thick with institutions that connect people to one another. As a wise woman once said, it takes a village to raise a child. Both the village of Oostburg and the village of Chevy Chase are that village. Where these institutions are, the American dream is alive. But so much of the country doesn't have them. The, the institutions are fading and anemic. And so this is the affliction of the working class and the middle class. Some people posit just an economic uh, reason. Some people posit just a sort of moral reason. It's something in between almost. Too many places have too few robust institutions of civil society, and the people there are left alienated, lacking a safety net, lacking a sense of purpose. <clears throat> so what does community do? Um, I would guess it does a lot more than you would think, because for most of the people in this audience, community and civil society are the air you breathe. If you went to college, if your parents went to college, you spent most of your life immersed and enmeshed in all these institutions, and you don't even notice it, that you were put into clubs as a kid, that in college you were involved in these things. When you came out of college, you landed in a workplace probably that acts as such an institution where people are providing advice, where people are providing support if things go wrong. Just being in certain circles, whether for me it was sort of conservative journalism or being you know, a Catholic, a young Catholic here in DC, you just land in these webs. And then as a parent, you, it's easy to, you get the emails to sign your kids up for Little League and music lessons and all these things, and it's just sort of handed to you. And so, your parents were probably plugged into those institutions as well. Your children will be as well. So what do they do? First, they provide a safety net. So the, the foreword to Alienated America is a, a story that happened to me. And I didn't realize its importance at first until I wrote a column about it and I got tons of people responding. It was about our daughter, uh, Eve. When she was one years old, she was getting really sick, having some trouble breathing, getting a little lethargic, and then one Sunday, we did what we call the divide and conquer, because we have six kids, and you can't always get them all to behave well at mass, and one of them was sick. So I went to the early one, the 8.30 mass at St. Andrew Apostle with the, the older kids, with, with most of the kids. My wife went with the oldest, and I stayed home with the baby to the 11.30. During this mass, I saw Eve was going from lethargic to collapsed, and I realized that it was, it was really bad. And so I tried calling Katie. She wasn't answering. She had the car. I started running down the street. Luckily, there's a... Uh, a uh, urgent care center a little bit down, down the block. In the end, uh, Eve ended up not just at our local hospital, Holy Cross Hospital, but at the uh, Children's Hospital here in Washington, D.C. to get enough oxygen into her lungs. When my son was reading this preface the other day, he said to me, he said, do you know that that was the week that we had the best lunches in the whole time we've been at school? Why? because we were brought so many meals that week. We ended up giving them away to other people. But one family brought us a corner bakery sandwiches. These things were like amazing. When we went back to Costco turkey sandwiches the next week, it was a big letdown. And when I was at the hospital, there was one guy who was, I won't, even, I won't name him because this is illegal, but he was smuggling beer in for me and smuggling dark chocolate in for my wife. Um, 
And so it's just this great swarm of friends bringing stuff in for us, calling, uh, doing the, the carpool without us. And so <clears throat> what I write in the preface is, in that moment, waking up at 4 a.m. with a sore neck in the tiny curtain booth of the PICU, I had an image of a swarm of friends, families, neighbors rallying to our aid. But as I considered it more during our stay, I saw in greater detail the contours of this support. As I thought about each person or couple who helped us, wrote, called, I noticed these weren't simple bilateral relationships. In almost every case, there was an institution that linked us. Again, this wasn't how we thought of our friends generally. They were just our friends. But when I described it, I found myself speaking of the couple from our parish, the family from our pool. Some came from parents at, uh, some help came from parents at the same boys' school where our oldest sons go. Others were my college classmates. Others were my work colleagues at the Examiner or AEI, parents of the kids that I'd coached in baseball help. The woman who sent the corner bakery feast in my wife, is in my wife's book club and attends the same Virginia parish as my wife's parents. Grubhub gift card came from an organization on whose board I had sought. Our dense and broad network of friends, which had become a short-term safety net, wasn't merely a network of friends. It was a network of organizations, companies, churches, schools, and clubs. So that's the safety net that you live in if you belong to all these things. And it's not just that catching you when you fall. It's also what's above. It's a sense of purpose. And it's, it provides real material benefits even when you're not in a case of emergency. Raj Chetty is a researcher associated with Stanford and Harvard. He studied economic mobility across the country. And he found that it varies incredibly from region to region. So what defines the regions where people can climb up the ladder, do better than their parents, move up quintiles? Per pupil spending in the public school has a small upward uh, lift. There's lots of things that have some effect. The, um, the biggest difference were two main factors. One, the measures of social capital, as done by Penn State. And um, so that is how many bowling leagues, how much volunteering, how many churches, that sort of thing. That was a central determining factor, one of the three most, one of the two most important in your ability to climb up the ladder. And the other was a percentage of intact families. So strong families and strong communities aren't just nice things to have. They're the key to the American dream of doing as well or better than your parents. So institutions of civil society catch you when you fall, give you a sense of purpose, provide good modeling, and help you climb up the ladder. These are the little platoons. They're the beating heart of the American dream. So what's going on where these platoons don't exist? Now, again, I'm a journalist. One of the things I do, and I'm not the one who named it this. My colleague Byron York calls it my bar reporting, which is where you go to a bar and sit down, tell people you're a political reporter, and pretty soon they're telling you all their views. And the thing is that some bars are better for bar reporting than others. You don't want to go to a college bar because Frankly, college kids don't vote, and half of them are from out of state. If you don't want to go to a tourist hotel bar, obviously, because most of those people are from out of state. But one of the things, I would found the sweet spot. It was yuppie Irish pubs. And I don't think that this was just my own personal taste. I really do think that there was something to be said for yuppie Irish pubs providing. You had liberals. You had conservatives. You had centrists. You often had husbands and wives who were in different parties, which makes for a great interview. You had rich. You had uh, middle class. You had young people, you had old people. But what I had been skipping for years, because there weren't a lot of involved voters, had been sort of the roadside country bars. In 2016, that changed. Um, and I started going to those places. So I started uh, in Fayette County, Pennsylvania, which is south of Pittsburgh. I picked it because I found a grad student who had done studies on the drop off in church attendance in uh, counties in Pennsylvania. And the, um, one of the biggest drop-offs in both Catholic and evangelical attendance was Fayette County, south of Pittsburgh. And so I was there. And thanks to Yelp, I found a bar called Smitty's, which is renowned for its wings. And it was great. But it was exactly this sort of roadside bar. Nobody walks there. You pull into a gravel parking lot. And the front, the windows are all tiny. So it's all dark inside. And, it was exactly the places I had been skipping in 2004 through 2008. And uh, the clientele was what you would think. It was white, working class. 100% of them who expressed their political opinions had supported Trump in the primary, were voting for Trump in the general, were skeptical of Republicans like Pat Toomey, um, but just as skeptical of any Democrats, and uh, lots of animosity towards Hillary. And so I asked him about the economy. And there's tons of complaints about 
welfare fraud. There are stories that you will hear in every bar that you go to where this issue comes up, where they're talking about, here is, oh, I, my friend told me that her neighbor saw somebody buying T-bone steaks with their food stamps and they were gonna feed them to their dog because they can't get dog food with food stamps. Or this guy's on disability, but he's really working a side job and he's using the disability money to buy drugs. And a lot of complaints about the unworthy poor getting these food stamp benefits. And there was a racial undertone to a lot of these comments. And so I, one of the reporting techniques that I used, I call being kind of a jerk. It's where you, you behave in such a way that no person, decent person would behave towards another person. And I started prodding them. And I, because after all, this was 2.30 on a Tuesday, and all these guys complaining about welfare cheats were sitting at the bar. And before you try to turn this on me, I was literally getting paid to be in the bar at 2.30 on a Tuesday. This was my job, OK? I don't think these other guys were all political reporters. And so one guy, Dave, has, uh, is on disabilities, explaining he can't sit still, he can't stand, and going on. I said, Dave, Dave, you've been sitting at this bar in Smitty's drinking for an hour and a half, yet you can't sit still at a desk? And <clears throat> Dave says, yeah, well, today, I, I'm numb because my son died this morning. And this, this shook me out of where I thought the, the conversation was going to be going, of course. And uh, Fayette County, it's, it's not surprising there. The overdose death rate is 57 per 100,000. That's 50% higher than the state's average, which itself is twice the national average. Um, that's overdoses, suicides, deaths of despair, drug, uh, alcohol-related deaths. Those are the things, those are the sort of road, the end of the road when we start with alienation. These are all much higher among the socially disconnected. Look at suicide rate by state. It's inversely proportional to population density. Psychiatrist Aaron Cariety explained the rise in white middle-aged suicides by saying, we're not living in community anymore. We're living in isolation, and we don't have people to provide meaning and give us hope. Other health issues, those who were more socially isolated were more likely to die during a given period than their socially connected neighbors, even after correcting for all sorts of factors. And this is where the retreat from marriage happens as well. The marriage rates are dropping off among the working class, not among the elites. Um, my colleague at AEI, Brad Wilcox, writes, quote, the eroded power and presence of churches, unions, veterans organizations, athletic groups in the lives of middle America has undercut many of the habits of the heart that would otherwise sustain strong marriages. And sure enough, it's important to focus on church here. If you go to church regularly, you're less likely to do drugs, die these deaths of despair, less likely to cheat on your wife, abuse your wife, or get divorced. And the kids of people who go to church, Robert Putnam wrote in uh, a 2015 book, Our Kids, quote, have better relations with their parents, other adults, have more friendships, and are less uh, prone to risky behaviors such as substance abuse, drugs, alcohol, uh, delinquency, premarital sex. So that's what you get from alienation or, and the social isolation that hits many parts of rural America are these bad outcomes. So what's behind it? Um, there's a notion that Alexis de Tocqueville puts forward, and Yuval Levin and his, uh, has summed it up nicely. He writes, collectivism and atomism are not opposite ends of the political spectrum, but rather two sides of one coin. They are closely related tendencies. They often coexist and reinforce one another. So that is over-centralization and um, hyper-individualism. They sound opposite, but they're two sides of the same coin. So over-centralization. The welfare state is culprit number one. Uh, if you guys remember Jonathan Gruber, the Obamacare guy who um, said we were banking on the stupidity of the American people when we crafted how to pitch Obamacare, he actually did a study on crowding out and found that New Deal spending crowded out at least 30% of benevolent church spending, going on a very local uh, uh, methodology there. His, his research partner later found that the opposite was true also. Decreases in government expenditures led to significant increases in church charitable spending. So when a big government program comes in through the New Deal, Great Society, Obamacare, civil society retreats. And this, again, is not, I had one angry liberal economist who now blocks me on Twitter uh, bark at me in public once that, 
oh, well, you're upset about welfare spending because you lose your volunteer hours. And it, it was sort of a shocking way to put it, but because he doesn't value the institutions of civil society except in a very simple, direct way. How much money are they spending on and giving to the poor and the hungry? And spending more money on the poor and the hungry is a very good thing to do. But if to do it, you have to destroy the institutions of civil society that build the infrastructure around which these people can live good lives and build healthy families, then are you really helping them? And mass media is also a case of over-centralization. Our attention is all drawn towards the single debate, things that do not affect our lives, such as a, a Mueller investigation or um, almost anything Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez says. These things take over our attention and take our attention away from what is close at hand. On the flip side of that same coin is hyper-individualism. Technology allows us to all retreat into our own little world. Um, and uh, here I want to read a passage that was uh, inspired by a good friend of mine who is sitting in this room. Um, do you remember what page that's on? It's, it's something like 162, I think. So anyway, it's about how technology allows us to um, if you've got a coffee maker in your room, if you've got, uh, let me see, hyper-individualism, here we go. Um, that what technology does is allows us to live a life that does not have to leave the house. You get an app that allows you to bring your groceries. You have a nice coffee maker in your house that allows you to... Uh, here we go. I talk about when we got a dog in 2012, I would ask my neighbor to swing by and let her out, but now we use an app. Um, think about all the things you count on your neighbor or roommate for, or used to at least. A ride to the airport, take an Uber. A cup of sugar, fresh direct. Any small arrangement of convenience, either regular or in a pinch, for which you might count on a neighbor, you can now pay someone to come on demand. This is both a cause and a mitigating instrument of the erosion of neighborliness that can arise when suburbs become isolating and atomizing. You can mind your own business, keep to yourself, stream any movie, never have to face a neighbor, and you're less likely to do so. When you do leave the house, it's from your attached garage. You drive to a central strip mall that serves an area much larger than your neighborhood. It's a rarity then if you even bump into a friend while out and about. You don't need an evening stroll for exercise because you pay for a gym or a home gym. The serendipitous encounters, oh, and now the new uh, exercise bikes allow you to have fake friends because they have like a coach there on the screen. Uh, the serendipitous encounters with neighbors become rarer and rarer as our lives are increasingly bespoke, made contingent on our whims and our tastes. And I remember writing that and then thinking of how some people might react. And so I wrote, I have a few close friends who are introverts for whom the preceding paragraph sounds like heaven. And it's nice that people have the option to be hermits. But there are societal costs to a reduced connection. So this is the negative critique I want somebody to write of my book, is how Tim Carney just wrote a book about how introverts are ruining America. Um, <clears throat> I don't think that's exactly it. But enabling us all to unplug for our immediate material needs has had a negative um, effect. So this flip side, hyper-individualism, over-centralization, they came to sort of this beautiful hideous apotheosis in 2012 with a slideshow produced by the Obama campaign titled The Life of Julia. And so in The Life of Julia, she starts off as this little girl in a bedroom by herself with the slideshow explaining that Barack Obama's government programs, you know, Head Start gave her great education and Obamacare gave her all this. And then she's in a classroom all by herself and she goes through her teenage years and there's never another human being in this whole thing except for the benevolent state and Barack Obama providing everything she needs. And then she graduates college where she's the only person on the stage. And then she steps out and quote, under President Obama, Julia decides to have a child. Now again, there's no other humans here. So this is some, um, you know, some virgin birth divinely conceived through Obamacare or something like that. Centralized state allows us to be these atomized individuals. It comes and it cuts the horizontal bonds that connect us to one another, but it also crushes the institutions. Specifically, it it does the crowding out I spoke about earlier, but it chases the church out of the public square. There's a line from uh, liberal writer Kevin Drum. He wrote at the beginning of 2012, 
I'm tired of religious groups operating secular enterprises, such as hospitals and schools, hiring people of multiple faiths, serving the general public, taking taxpayer dollars, which was itself a red herring, but, and then claiming that deeply held religious beliefs should exempt them from public policy. So in other words, if you want to have deeply held religious beliefs, you may not operate hospitals or schools, hire people outside of your faith, or serve the general public. The Obama administration made the same argument in Hobby Lobby, in Hobby Lobby, and they would regularly talk about freedom of worship rather than free exercise. And Nancy Pelosi would say, well, when asked about uh, contraceptive mandates, said, well, I do my religion on Sundays. Then she noted that she tries to go to mass other days of the week, which is great. She probably goes to the ma mass more than I do, but we can't just do our religion in mass, in synagogue, in church, in, in the moments that we're in, you know, on our Sabbath or anything like that. The free exercise of religion, the free exercise of Christianity is loving your neighbor. You have to be able to go out, build these institutions, serve them seven days a week. And so the efforts to drive the church out of the public square are cold-hearted, cruel efforts that result in the sort of alienation and deaths of despair that we talk about. So I'm going to wrap up because I want questions and we only have so much time. So if you ever write a book, you're supposed to write a final chapter that has all the solutions. And my first book, it went, I, I, I'm a conservative, so I'm not great at solutions. So my first book was like export import bank bad, sugar bad, ethanol bad index. And I got a little chastised for not having a solution chapter. So my second book, Obamanomics, had a solution chapter. I went back and I read it, and I think I disagree with 80% there. I was talking about how we need a gold standard, all this other stuff, how John McCain could have, it, it all seems entirely insane to me. So how do you do a solution chapter in this case? Well, the first is you think about the Ten Commandments. I think a majority of those are thou shalt not, right? So we can, we can do a solution chapter that starts with thou shalt not. Federal government should stop trying to drive religion out of the public square. Make peace with an adoption agency that wants to be a Christian ag adoption agency. Uh, make, peace with, um, make peace with Hobby Lobby, being a, a businesses too, or institutions of civil society. Don't try to force Catholic hospitals to abort babies. Stop this crazy, insane interpretation of separation of church and state. Remember, they're constantly trying to expand the state while also crying separation of church and state, which amounts to trying to chase the church again into a corner, allowing it to exist maybe one day a week. Um, stop subsidizing bigger homes. This is the main effect of the uh, mortgage interest deduction is not allowing more people to buy homes. It allows the people who buy homes to buy bigger homes. Nothing wrong with bigger homes. We need a big home. I wish I had a bigger home. I have lots of friends who have more kids and they have even smaller homes, and the kids are sleeping on top of each other. It would be great to have a bigger home, but the federal government should not be subsidizing bigger homes. This is not a, uh, not a public policy goal. So those are two of the big uh, thou shalt nots. There's other things, um, and other people know a lot more about these, but building communities for people, not for cars. Montgomery County is an inhuman place. People are killed by cars all the time because everywhere you look, two, three-lane roads everywhere. It's hard to be uh, walkable to anything. This was a mistake. We should stop doing it. The more you walk places, the more you bump into the, your friends, the more you get to know the guy behind the diner counter, um, et cetera. Local control of public schools is a key thing. Again, in Montgomery County, we don't have local control. The county runs a county of one point whatever million, and it's all centrally managed. This manifests itself regularly for us in the winter when we're down in sort of central middle Montgomery County and we'll get a snow day when there's no snow or ice or anything on the roads because in upper Montgomery County, which judging by the weather reports I get from there is north of Alaska, in upper Montgomery County, there's like a tundra and, and all this going on. That's just a little sort of almost benign example of the central managed decision. There's no JFK High School near my house. There's no community around that. That's just where you get allocated to. In a lot of places in this country, in nice suburbs, especially in New York and New England, the town is built around a high school and the people have control over the high school. That's the sort of thing policymakers can do. But ultimately, no big solution is possible because centralization would be self-defeating in this. So what and who can fix this? So let me bring it back home. I talked about the synagogue on Arcola and the synagogue on Kemp Mill. Right where Arcola and Kemp Mill intersect 
is my parish, St. Andrew Apostle. And I'm gonna, I end there in the book, not because it's some dream of civil society. Again, most of the parishioners there can't walk there. It's got all the sort of typical problems of, of suburbia and a, and a lot of Catholic parishes, but I sort of imagine, I use some sort of points of, of hope from there. My daughter just finished CYO basketball, and on the back of her jersey, there's this little circle that says Al Weaver on the back of all their jerseys. So Al Weaver, I didn't know who this guy was, but I looked him up. He was a guy who coached CYO basketball, other youth sports there, long after his kids had outgrown it. This is what he dedicated his life to. He had a nine to five job, working class guy, and he'd come to the parish and he'd be there every day. And so now Al Weaver has his name on basketball jerseys of kids who have never met him playing for uh, the kids of parents who have never met him. And I just thought of what an honor that is. And here in DC, there's lots of things. This auditorium is named after somebody. There's buildings named after somebody. And this is a great thing that I'd, I'd like to do if I have a lot of money, is build institutions of civil society with lots of money and put them up there and you know hopefully get them named after me. But most of us don't have the ability or the money to do that. But everybody can be Al Weaver. Most people can go and, and put in there's nothing wrong with being the guy who funds the institutions, but again, most of us can't be that, but most of us can be the guy who puts in the time and builds up an institution. Or even people talk about, oh, well, that's a nice neighborhood to raise your kids. Can you make your own neighborhood be a nice place to raise kids? In uh, my mother-in-law's neighborhood, she said it happened when just a couple parents started doing a weekly potluck, and then suddenly all the kids who used to be cooped up inside their house are now running around just because the parents know each other more and they're more likely to sit on the front porch and some parents sort of ostentatiously walk their kids for no good purpose in a stroller around the neighborhood just to bump into other neighbors. That's the solution to this problem. Starting a t-ball team, coaching basketball long after your kids have, have done it. Maybe the accomplishment is not gonna be ever getting your name on a jersey, but it might be a couple that gets married because they were able to find a neighborhood that was a good place to raise kids because you made it be a good place to raise kids. So no, there isn't one big solution. I end with sort of a, a thought that's unsatisfying for most of Washington, that there's 20,000 little solutions of little platoons or hundreds of millions of little platoons, hundreds of millions of solutions. So, my hope when I come, when I go around and I talk about Alienated America is that uh, it inspires the readers of the book to be the solution and that the country's gonna need a million little solutions and hopefully right in this room we've got a, a, a few dozen of the solutions to this problem. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna take questions. What time do we have to kick everybody out? Well, okay, so we've got a little bit of time. Yes, sir. Oh, wait, we've got a microphone coming. And I'll try to make my answers as brief as possible. So, you know, the, <clears throat> the tax reform that Donald Trump, you know, yep. initially reduced deductions for the charitable contributions like, you know, churches and, and, you, know, and you know, charities and that thing, thing like that. Do you support uh, a simpler income tax system, even if eliminating most or all charitable deductions on the taxes? You know, yeah, so by uh, increasing the standard deduction, he's made it so fewer people are getting a specific deduction for charity, so that might create a little less incentive for charitable deductions. Uh, what we at the Washington Examiner have endorsed is a limited above-the-line deduction for charity, so your first 3,000 in charity. And the f here's the thing about that. A, more people, even people who would never get to the point where they're itemizing, they're taking the standard deduction, they'll be getting a charitable deduction. And by having a limit that's not, not really that high, but is much higher than most people give, it could cre in, uh, conceivably create an incentive where you can just imagine your uh, local charity saying, hey, by the way, it's December, have you only given $2,500? Give us $500 to hit your annual max. So I do think that Charity, everybody who talks about tax reform in Washington wants all the deductions eliminated except for their own. So I guess I'm doing the same sort of special pleading. But I think when you're giving away money, it's like if I got a paycheck, if I got paid in cash, 
and the money lit on fire before I ever got to deposit it, I wouldn't have to pay taxes on that. If you're giving away the money, not to say you're not getting anything of value, but you're not keeping the money. And so there should be some more of a deduction, even for people who do an, uh, an itemized deduction. It shouldn't be massive, and it shouldn't be any bigger for the wealthy than it is for the, the working class and middle class, but it should be there above the line. So other questions? Yes, sir, in the middle. I wonder what your feelings are on gun control of uh, the tremendous number of weapons in people's hands in this country today, uh, the proliferation of machine guns, mm -hmm. of course, the rise in crime rate, guns in the hands of people that shouldn't have them. Uh, do you have any thoughts on this as a way of trying I, to improve our culture? I don't think taking people's guns away improves our culture. <laughs> I think that would be exactly backwards. There was some story, and this was out of Australia, but it got me thinking to some extent about gun culture, an unhealthy gun culture, being a fruit of this alienation. In other words, guns as sport is something that's good and healthy, and hunting and all that stuff is good and healthy around this country. And just some people's mindset towards self-defense or where they live is going to be necessary. But there is a point in this country, there are parts where gun culture becomes overblown. And there was this one um, story about some grandma in Australia, and she uh, she kept, sorry, I'm confusing two different stories. This is a story about the, Ameri about the US. And the grandma has a welcome mat that basically says, buzz off, I've got you know a 45. And people, there's a lot of conservative websites that were like, oh, yeah, go. I mean, it's good that she can defend herself. And if she's a grandma, maybe she has extra reason to have one. But buzz off, I've got a 45 is not a healthy attitude to have towards anyone who might show up at your door. The Bible explicitly says you're supposed to welcome these people and not threaten to shoot them. And so on the other hand, a healthy gun culture a lot of times is one of these institutions. I mean, uh, the cracking down on gun shows always, so just another way in which the government's trying to say, all you guys getting together is, is something we're gonna crack down on. So I don't think taking away guns will make people more neighborly. I think the more neighborly people are, the less likely you are to um, be overly armed. Go to the village of Oostburg. There's not a lot of woods, so there's not a ton of hunting. So people have a lot more guns than they do here, but I bet they have a lot fewer guns in the village of Oostburg that I'm talking about than they do in many other rural communities where people are more, like Fayette County, where people are more scared of their neighbors. It was exactly, it's a, a point right in my book, that guy Dave, whose son had died, I asked him about his neighbors. He said, I don't trust none of mine, and that's why I keep a gun right next to my bed. So you want to talk about gun culture, build up stronger communities, and you'll have a much healthier gun culture in the US. Uh, yes, uh, microphone coming from there. David Burton, the Heritage Foundation. I, I agree with almost everything you've said, including the fact that the solutions ultimately are private solutions and local. Um, but I wanted to, you talk a lot about religion and the importance of religion. My lived experience with religion is interesting, but my experience has been that churches are becoming more and more politicized yeah. and, and not really engaging in the uh, constructive uh, social uh, functions that you discussed, yep. not engaging in the charitable functions, but are, are in effect becoming arms of political parties. And that's something I think is destructive and also means that they're not discharging the kinds of functions that you and I would like to see them discharge. And I wondered if you had any thoughts about that, observations of that, things we can do to depoliticize religion. So, I mean, it's tricky, because you don't want to say depoliticize, but I would say the degree to which they're becoming arms of national ideological movements or arms of national parties is a very bad thing. And one interesting thing here that I'd like my next research to do, the the positive effects of whether it has to do with how children turn out, how marriages turn out, drug abuse, et cetera, the positive effects of religiosity are almost all have to do with attendance. But attendance is really hard to measure. But in any event, the positive effects of religiosity don't seem to show up in the American South as much as they show up in other parts of the country. So why might that be? There might be a theological explanation about religion, about denominations that really emphasize a personal relationship over the community-mindedness of it. That's over my head, that theological discussion. 
but it might be also that a lot of the, the where you have more mega churches, a the meganess of it takes away from the community building, but b there's something more. There's a more ideological, more partisan strain in a lot of those churches. So not on, so I think you may be able to, if you had sort of refined enough measurement, show that the more politicized a church is, the worse these life outcomes are because they're focused on again. Um, making an ideological argument, talking about things that, uh, while they matter and are rooted in, in moral law, are not um, necessarily the primary purpose of, of a congregation or a parish. So I agree wholeheartedly. When, when we talk about the enemies of, of civil society, one of them is the, the churches themselves uh, frittering away the authority that they have had. And that's one of the ways. I'm a Catholic, though, and the main way I think about them frittering it away is through the complete um, self-serving handling of the abuse scandal. Um, that when people are driven away, that the victims of the abuse, in addition to those thousands and thousands of people whose lives can be ruined, there's tens of thousands of people who are driven away from the church. And I had an experience, I was writing some of this book in my neighborhood pub, the Stained Glass Pub. And I made sure to show them a copy because I'm sure dozens of people sit at the end of every bar saying they're writing a book. So I had to show them that I was the guy who actually was. But when I was talking to uh, one of the guys there, he said, oh, you're a Catholic. I used to be a Catholic. And I try to evangelize a little. But when he told me a story, he was not himself a victim. But when, deal when seeing a priest get moved around his, uh, his diocese, and then he tried to sign up to be like an assistant baseball coach, and he had to get an FBI background check and a fingerprint and sit through this whole thing. And he just thought, they're treating me like the criminal. Well, the father, who's actually the criminal, is over there. And he was so angry at the church, he just left and never came back. And I found myself in a position where I could, I, I had no counter argument to make to him. And <clears throat> so the churches, through this mismanagement of these horrible abuses, are making new victims, which are the people that they're pushing out into alienation. So I agree on all sorts of, of scores. The, the first place of reform is, is going to have to be in the institutions. And as a Catholic, I, uh, it's particularly important to me that it, it starts in, in the church. Yes. Have you considered that uh, all of these factors interrelate and uh, that they correlate until they don't? Uh, like the Catholic Church is a very centralized uh, organization, but some, uh, some things predominate that override that in a nonlinear sort of way. And I could visualize the re that the data you might have gathered uh, has the germs of a statistical study that could, under that could uncover these mm -hmm. correlations. I think that a lot of... Um what I tried to do sort of methodologically, again, and I'm not a statistician or an economist, but I, I tried to look at um, this from dozens of different angles. So I mentioned Raj Chetty. He looks at the correlation on a local level of civil society, intact family, and upward mobility, and controls for all these factors, regression analysis, et cetera. And he sees civil society and intact family at that end. I looked at studies about um, marriage that, uh, f that found similar things about the need for it. And then I looked at places where we separate, really separate out the different things that tend to go together. If money, strong communities, and good outcomes tend to go together, what can you pull these three apart and see what ends up happening? And the fact that you get perfectly middle-class places in Wisconsin and Utah having elite-level outcomes that have strong religiosity suggests to me that the money, the main role of money, and there was also another study that showed, you know, wealthier people in America, at least up to $75,000, are happier. But, and uh, Charles Murray has this in his book, not if you control for two things, or three things, work satisfaction, marriage, and how strong you feel your community is. So that's an effort to pull apart. If you have money, you're more likely to have strong community. But the money is helps you get the necessary condition, I argue. The other thing is giving people money without strong community. So I went to Williston, 
one of the fracking towns in North Dakota here, and the men all live in man camps, which on one level are kind of awesome. This is like you get this flat screen TV, this, this room of your own, the, the triple wide trailer that's a common area is, um, so this is one of these fracking towns, is it's got like ping pong tables and pool tables and foosball tables, and there's a 24 seven buffet of like just cheeseburgers and onion rings. And I was looking at this, I was just like, this is kind of almost like, like heaven here, but what happened when all these guys got all this money? The, the women of Williston did not start getting married like the women in other places where these good wages are. The other good outcomes that usually correlate with money weren't showing up in Williston, and not just Williston, which is in the middle of nowhere, but also the fracking towns in Texas and Pennsylvania, which are not as remote, don't have as much of a, uh, are not as, as dominated by migration. And so I think it's, we separated the money from the community and repeatedly found that the community was the thing that promoted the good outcomes. I'm open to, um, I hope somebody can replicate the study that was done on the fracking towns. I'm open to all sorts of other uh, findings. I did studies with, I looked at studies involving the Hajj, involving fasting during Ramadan, and all of these seem to point to joint efforts together. Aim towards a higher purpose are what build the infrastructure around people that points them to the good life, and that this can be separated from money. In any event, uh, thank you guys very much. So we're out of time. We do have sandwiches uh, outside, so help yourself to that. We also have books for sale, and they are cheaper here than they are on Amazon. So if you were inspired by today's lecture, get a copy of the book. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>